the story of documentary is not just a forward-looking story. It's not just falling apart now that it's leaving film and going into these new forms. Actually, it's always been there. It's a very deep history. It's a very deep story. So this project really went back before film to look at those endeavors to analyze and interrogate the world and find some way to do it, whether, whether through notches on sticks or through weavings and tidal charts that uh, the Polynesians might have made. And what intrigues me and what makes this moment so special um, in terms of what our lab is doing is that if you look at the very beginning of the film medium, 1895, 80% of what's copyrighted from 1895 up until about 1905 is nonfiction. Fiction kicks in with the shift in the business model and the rise of the Nickelodeon circa 1905, 1906. But it's not predominant until that point. If you look at the first uses of color, they are nonfiction because people understand the world and apply it to the world. If you look at the first uses of sound in the Soviet Union or in Germany, documentary. Documentary. It's Walter Ruttmann and Siga Vertov who make the first sound, the public sound efforts uh, uh, in sound film documentary. And the reason, I think, and the reason so much innovation is happening in the documentary space today, uh, technologically, is because we understand the world. We understand the referent. Technology can tweak it and play with it, but we know the referent. If you're making fiction, you have to sort of create the Harry Potter world where, you know, can you make people float or how does the world work? Are there monsters? There's a rule set that narrative has to build in in addition to the technological side. Nonfiction doesn't have that problem. The rule set we're kind of aware of. I mean, it's always a new world that we see, but we kind of get the rules. Therefore, you can play with the technology. Anyway, that's what this project set out to do. And today, I thought, I mean, What's maybe useful to think about, and this will, this will almost as an antidote to the pitches you guys just made, one thing that's very useful to remember is that um, every medium in the modern era, let's say from, from, print, from, from mass production of print in the, late, in the mid to late 19th century onwards, every single mass medium has been accompanied by dreams and utopian visions but by nightmares, by, by dis a sense of kind of the world is going to transform with this platform. And there are lots of ways, you know, you photography is a great one because you get all this crazy, these, not that this is an example of a panic exactly, although this is a real example of a panic. Uh, and this is in the world, this kind of craziness. Um, the typical narratives would be, so, so when cheap, when printing presses are able to sort of kick out the stuff cheaply, penny novels, uh, two and five cent um, penny dreadfuls, cheap literature. You would think that the spreading of literacy would be a, perceived as a great thing. In fact, it was demonized. And there are endless stories about how th the narratives are quite interesting. Um, bad eyes and sweaty palms are a motif that show up again and again. The kids read these things. It makes their hands sweat, makes their eyes go bad. And literally court cases where they kill, where you know murders are then attributed to the causal effects of reading this bad literature. Nickelodeon, Edom Dito, it's called a school for crime when, it, when the fictional stuff kicks up starting in 1905. Part of this in the United States is an attempt to keep out the French stuff, which is deemed, how do you stop the French industry from, which dominated the US at the time? How do you get rid of it? Call it immoral, uh, call it demoralizing, and call it a school for crime. But again, Huge pressure on early film in terms of how it's degrading morals, how it's causing children to uh, misbehave. Bad for the eyes, sweaty palms. Comics industry does exactly the same thing happens with uh, the, the, when, before the introduction of the comic book code. Mass burnings of, of comics in this country because of the deleterious effects of comics. Uh, so it's, it's usually the moments at which these media enjoy widespread popularity that there's an immediate pushback, like either from other media forms or from social arbiters. How do we put this thing back in the bag? Um, I don't know. I lived through the play Judas Priest backwards and flush your, <laughs> flush your head and someone did it. I mean, whatever. These, so this is, this is with this still. And we're starting now to see it with VR. For all the euphoria about, about the empathy machine and therapeutic uses of VR, this other kind of narrative is fast emerging. Uh, and with, uh, my prediction is, the greater the popularity of VR, the more frequent you're going to see these kinds of, these kinds of narratives. Um, what we always forget, though, 
is that actually what's going on here is kind of a class, there's kind of a class and taste divide. That these very same representations can be glorified in one setting. If you're reading Dante, it's perfectly fine to, to sort of have this, this egregious imagery. But if it's in comic book form, it needs to be stopped and, and now. Um, and it's good for business. So just tracking time's endless hysteria. Uh, it re it's a reminder that you know, panic sells. Jump to today. Um, what I want to do is, is briefly talk about, uh, really about algorithms. Um, algorithms have been with us a very long time, back to the Egyptians. The pyramid is actually why it's so damn precise is, in fact, there's, a, there's an algorithmic. A second is the, is the unit that, that actually helped it to, be, to scale so well. Um, they've been with us a long time, and they're creating, um, beginning to create a lot of concern, and for very good reasons. Uh, but I want to talk about the condition that they represent. Before I do that, just a couple of quick things that you guys all know. But one of them is that in the last decade or so, we've been undergoing kind of a big shift in a lot of our cult long-term cultural behaviors. So for example, if you think of the project of, uh, of Diderot's encyclopedia, pretty much from the rise of the printing press until, and, and now it's a mixed condition, but until now, one of the things the printing press did was allow us, you know, before the printing press, you have handwritten books that are typically well, very low circulation, obviously, but generally religious or pretty, pretty contained in terms of their sphere of influence. With the rise of print comes also a rise of a new kind of authority, the authority of the author. Authorship, attribution, those become the marks, those become the guarantors that something is worthwhile or not. And the encyclopedia is a good example. This is written by tons of people. I mean, the luminaries of the, Fr the luminaries of the 18th century France are writing in this thing, but it's all vetted by Diderot, and the success or failure of this encyclopedia is about his authority as an editor. Jump to Wikipedia. Don't really know who wrote it. Don't really know who edited it. You know, until a few years back, people were saying, instructing their students, it still happens in some of our classes here, not to use it because it's an unreliable, changeable, dynamic, you know, unauthored source. I would argue that it has huge advantages. Peel back the page and look at the edits, and you see exactly where the sites of contention are. You know what's either not said in an Encyclopedia Britannica article or asserted against competing views. So actually, I would argue it, it leads to a superior truth. But the point is, it represents a shift in notions of authorship and um, uh, attribution, and therefore responsibility. If you jump to the, to the consumer market, we've seen another very interesting shift in the last, say, 20 years um, from materiality of things. If you bought a Louis Vuitton bag 20 years ago, if you go to an antique shop, a secondhand shop, and look at like Hermes or Louis Vuitton, Vuitton stuff, you could spot it even without the brand because it's really well made. It's, it's startlingly well made. Great materials, great craftsmanship. It like jumps off the shelf. Cut to the last decade or so, and it's about the logo. The, lo what, the materiality is irrelevant. Whether it's like plastic or whatever is not the point. The point is the brand. Another very interesting shift. Cut to the world of DVDs or records or videos or whatever. OK, we've gotten rid of all that stuff. We're now streaming it all. But again, a very interesting shift in what we own from like owning artifacts, collecting material things, to having access. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's really wonderful, because wherever you are, you can read your, your Amazon book, your Kindle book, or whatever. But of course, there's something else going on. We, we see here with our libraries. It used to be that if you subscribed to something for 50 years and then stopped, you at least had 50 years of back issues. In the world of access, when you stop your subscription, you've lost everything. There is nothing left. There is no backlog of, of issues. Better, and Kindle's a great example, Netflix, you name it, Spotify, because of the, the backside of data, you know, we know how fast you're reading this novel. We know where you stop. There's really interesting analytics that, are, that actually become a new business model. So access is not just the shift from ownership to access is not just a shift in the affordances that we as consumers face, but obviously a whole different, a whole different set of things. But again, something that's hit us pretty much in a strong way in the last decade. 
And then you just start to look around at the kind of economic stuff that's happening out there. Um, and it doesn't make a lot of sense, at least by, in terms of classical economics. WhatsApp selling for $19 million when the Washington Post, the same year that the Washington Post, the newspaper itself, sells for about $60 million. The best, you know, some of the best content in America for, six, for a sliver of $19 billion. And what's WhatsApp's business model? I mean, we understand the data set, et cetera. But where that money will come from is not at all clear. OK. Uh, Zuckerberg is interested in sort of stamping out the competition. That, that makes a certain sense. But $19 billion? Um, League of Legends, free to the whole free-to-play game market, generating you know billion plus a year. YouTube ads that you don't have to watch, <laughs> generating like fairly significant revenues. Not to say that YouTube is making profit. They're not, allegedly. But, but at least they're making a lot of money. So we've hit a kind of very, I think, this last decade has, has been really interesting in terms of a lot of shifting conditions. Conditions that have been with us actually for quite a long time are now kind of, we're kind of in brackish water. We have the old system. We have what's clearly kind of a new system. And that's the space that I'd like to jump into and talk about um, the algorithm. Um, we know that Brexit was heavily played by, like which ad you would see, and there were a myriad others, had a lot to, if you were like labor and kind of basically sympathetic with, with, with immigrants in, in the UK, you would start, you would get the ads that are a, about losing your job, basically, right? So this was, we know that, we now know that Cambridge Analytica, the same folks busy in our market were busy in theirs, uh, micro-targeting, and their claims, I don't know if their claims are accurate, but they really claim to have, you know, everyone's pro, basically anyone who's been online's profile, stuff that you guys are already working on. Um, and it's just interesting to look at their back channel where they're kind of arguing with people that say, ah, you're, you're full of crap, like, and they're defending their, <laughs> they're defending their egregious behavior. But, uh, and we also know that these technologies are a little wonky. Uh, today's Guardian has a nice piece on facial recognition technologies and race, uh, whether the Google mistakes of identifying blacks as, as gorillas or uh, the police, the police are on a different side, criminals. Um, yeah, you're black enough, you must, you know. And, and there, there, this is a long history. Um, uh, Instagram filters have this problem. You could look at Kodak film stock and also talk about this problem. It's a, it's a, it's a long problem of how these technologies get tested and deployed. And there's, a, at least in our culture, a white bias. But anyway, all to say, these are, these are definitely awkward technologies that are being um, applied in very heavy ways. And I think the, the, the bottom line I want to make here is that I, I think we rightly are deeply concerned about this. We have to temper our concern by understanding that we do have a reflex, a cultural reflex, to be suspicious of the next big thing. Yeah, I can put, you know, I just showed you every other media form, and we've been suspicious, rightly or wrongly, so usually a little of both. And part of what's going on with data and the algorithm is that, just some sense that it's bad. And I would say it's more like a gun in the hands of a chimp. The gun is not inherently good or bad, but it's in the control of an inferior mentality right now. It's in, it's in the hands of a chimp. We're looking at a system that has been kind of all about power and accretion of wealth for the last however many hundred years. And that's a system that now has a new tool, data and the algorithm. So of course it's going to use this in the most egregious possible way. And yet, we are potentially on the cusp of a new way of thinking, a new way of, of, of organizing our social systems that could be fantastic. But as long as the chimps have the power, it's going to be, uh, I shouldn't use that because of Planet of the Apes, but as long as these morons have the power, <laughs> it's really going to be a little bit, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fraught situation. So for example, the, 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 tool, the, the toilet um, uh, data collector. On the face of it is, I, I don't, I mean, I could imagine some really interesting mm -hmm. uses of that if you had a society that guaranteed high quality health care to all mm -hmm. with no chance of ever being not, knocked out of the system. Mm -hmm. Then it would be great. But it's that larger social condition that is still old world, that is still stone age, when we're armed with these kind of space age technologies. And it's that disjunction. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started with these kind of examples of there's something new happening, and it's not it seems all disruptive, 
but it's because we're inhabiting two orders at once, the old order and the new order, and that complicates a little bit um, how we, whether we will misuse or make good use of these, these technologies. Um, so I just want to, algorithms, as I said, are old. You know, the Egyptians, Euclid, Euclid uses one to, to find the, 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 the common denominator. That's what, 300 before the Christian era. It's an old technology. And it only really like cranks up with the era of big data and fast processing. So, of, of, so although an old idea, its relevance is a newfound idea. And I point here to Heidegger, because um, you're at the university and you've got to think about the man once in a while. But you know, Heidegger said something, I think, really profound. He, he uses this analogy of the world, the world image. And it, it's a really smart idea. He says that the very fact that we can imagine the world as an image is emblematic of the modern era. Like the modern from, let's say, 15th century till, till, till now. Like that modern is about the individual, the subject who looks at a world and commands it. And think about it. What happens in the 15th century? Printing press. So the ability to extend your analysis to the planet. And three-point perspective. That idea of seeing the world from a point of view. Those are about 30 years, within about 30, 35 years of one another, those two inventions. And they're both very much about the individual, an individual who stands and reflects and sees the world, like the world picture that you could sort of imagine like a photo. Before that, if you were to go to the Middle Ages, you get these like symbolic representations of the world. The big people are powerful, the little people are not. It's not about realism in our what we assume to be a kind of normative perceptual way. It's about a symbolic order of powerful and not powerful and God and whatever. It's not a, you know, we look at it and think, oh, they haven't figured it out yet. No, it reflects a particular mentality, a particular cosmology. And that shifts in the middle of the 15th century, and that's kind of been running us until now. It leads to the Enlightenment, leads to all the, the good and bad that we've accumulated. And I would argue that what the algorithm represents is a shift in that. An algorithm breaks that subject-object clarity and brokers information about me and pulls information from the textual world and creates something for me. I'm no longer able in many settings, like when I do a Google search, I can't just see what's out there. I see what Google thinks about me. Oh, you're an English speaker and you're based in North America and you're in this time zone and you're going to get, and based on your previous searches, you're going to get these, this kind of ad mix. I'm seeing a textual world that is extrapolated, an algorithmically extrapolated from me and used to construct a world for me. So that whole Heideggerian notion of the, the clarity of the modern, of me and the world, is now, is now muddled. And it's muddled by a force that I can't really put my fingers on. It's muddled. Now, I don't want to talk, you know, Typically, ideology would be in that space, the thing that distorts the world, and I can't see the world. I don't mean it in that kind of sense of false reality. I mean it in the sense of a constructive entity that has a lot of, you know, again, can be constructed for, for ill or not. It can be transparent or not. How we use it is always, the, is always the limit condition. But I think Heidegger really, in a nutshell, puts in a nutshell, in a, in a, in a metaphor, puts his finger on this, this thing that we're shifting away from, this the clarity of me and the world that you could see in a picture. So yeah, three-point perspective in the printing press. I should look at my slides. And I think a great example, it's no longer with us. It's so ephemeral, this world. But uh, So we have Piazza San Marco by Canaletto. You can go over and see it at Harvard. That's where this painting exists. Great example of three-point perspective, right? You know where you are. It's a little bit fudged, to be honest. But you kind of it's a very legible way of seeing the world for us. But we're moving into a world where something quite different is possible. Now, this is old photosynth. Photosynth still exists pretty much as a, as a kind of um, a 3D mapping tool. But when it started its life, all of four years ago or five years ago, it was a way to aggregate multiple photos from multiple people and multiple cameras in, and uh, suture them together into one kind of synthetic space. So this is. Um, this is, in fact, a composite of like hundreds of different tourist photos that, through the point cloud, are kind of re-aggregated as a space that you can go in and navigate and move around in. And, and to me, this really points to the, the difference between these two regimes. 
The, the Canaletto one is the modern. The modern that's been with us from the 15th century until more or less now. It's the thing that's starting to, to crumble. We understand the fixity of a point of view. We understand attribution. Right? Over here, we have multiple points of view, kind of, kind of contingently put together. Where Canaletto did this, we know who he was and when he did it. With Wikipedia or with Photosynth, it's hundreds of people. It's a lot of different attribution is quite diffused. We can't actually get our hands on it. Um, again, where Canaletto's thing is authored, this is, has the potential to be collaborative, which, which can be a really great thing. Um, where Canaletto's image is a totally stable and fixed text. It's been hanging in the museum forever. It hasn't really changed much. Something like Photosynth, there's no, you know, like, like Google Street View, what's the right way to look at it? I mean, it's, it's mobile. It's contingent. It's, 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 there is no st stable text. Uh, where this had a very clear relationship between the subject and the object, uh, over here on the, on the algorithmic side, there's that that layer, that intervening uh, layer that's kind of reading me and structuring that world. So it's a really new condition. And I think it's a, I think it's a profoundly new condition, really, given the stability of the last couple hundred years. And I think that's a space, that's the space within which a lot of the stuff you guys are talking about fits within. And the challenge is that in, in a number of cases that have come up, you know, um, this, this, this case in Chicago is a, a great one. The problem is this tool set is simply in the wrong hands and it's in the wrong cultural order. The cultural order has not kept up. So we can, we can and should kind of be very critical about the tools and certainly their application. But the other side of the equation is we have to really press hard for, it's going to be a hard thing to stop. You can't put the, the whatever it is back in the, what is it, the genie back in the bottle or whatever. So it's, it's also about like figuring out what to fight for in terms of issues of transparency or being able to see ourselves. The selfie thing is a great idea. I mean, yeah, so that's what's so exciting about the work you guys are doing because it's all in various ways grappling with this. Okay, so we talked about this already. This is the, again, really emblematizes that difference. So I'm intrigued just to, if I think about where algorithms are working in culture these days that, that, that show up. One of them is that we're seeing more and more gatekeepers that are algorithmically constructed. Uh, so for example, this is a company whose business model, this uh, Epigogics starts life as a risk management company. And they realize that um, screenplays, funding screenplays is a, is a pretty risky endeavor. Is this thing going to make money or not? Who are we going to cast? Do we give it the green light or not? So this company started to build software that could basically assess a script and casting decisions. You know, put it in, and out comes the to the to the third decimal point. Yeah, exactly. You know, bang, green light comes on, and you know you can go for it. So these are intriguing systems because we know that they because actually they enable the creation of things or not. Um, this is a detested technology in Hollywood right now. Like every mogul has a, has a nose that's been in the biz forever and knows a winner from a loser. But investors actually like numbers. And this is a number generator. Um, if you think of the business model that, that Netflix and Amazon are using right now, these guys are basically data aggregators. Netflix understands like what people like and don't like. They understand correlations across genres and with actors or whatever. They're very elaborate modeling systems. What they're able to do is spot holes. Like, huh, if people like this genre and they like this actor and there's nothing there, we can make something. Uh, Amazon's doing pretty much the same thing. So again, this is like a gatekeeper. Like, OK, we need a product that you know, hits these four marks and you've got a pretty much guaranteed success. So, so the modeling here is a very interesting one in terms of like in, both enabling us to have access to certain kinds of cultural forms, uh, either stimulating some production or closing down some production. Um, recommendation systems are, are, are obvious. We, all, we use them all the time. Right here in Somerville is the company Echo Nest. And Echo Nest is the, is the, is the, the backbone of, of companies like Spotify and Pandora that do a lot of music recommendation systems, right? So these guys are tracking like both your user pattern, but also people like you and what that pattern is, but also tracking musical frequency and instrumentation, blah, 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 and correlating all that and trying to come up with a fit that can 
make life easier by, by helping you discover new things, but on the other hand, kind of feeding you your own <laughs> output, to say it politely. Um, <laughs> And we know this from, you know, we know this from, pick your, pick your favorite source. In my case, it's, it's, it's Amazon uh, books. It does uncannily predict stuff that I've either read or probably should know about, but that comes at a cost, and that comes with something we need to be aware of, again, in terms of uh, profiling. Watching Facebook, now that this is pretty much part of our navigation of the social world, but also the, you know, with, with Facebook and the informational world with things like Google, these really become heavily fraught and loaded uh, issues. Sorry, William, can you go, what's the vertical axis there? Well, where? Percent, percent change month over month. Yeah. What? Of their algorithm, of their... The code, the code base. Okay. Like, really by character, they would. Mm. I don't know if it's the percent of the code is, is, is okay. the same as change. So one of the spaces where, where I think things are, we're starting to see a lot of um, action um, is in terms of text generators. They're pretty good. They're pretty advanced right now in the print world. So narrative science, for example, is, I mean, the, the sales figures in this area are like almost unbelievable. They claim like a billion plus stories last year. Now this is BuzzFeed. A lot of this is just squibs sent to BuzzFeed. Uh, these generators are quite good with structured data, so sports and finance, where you've got kind of a timeline and a and an underline. These can basically these are sold as data analytic tools. Mm -hmm. They jump into a data set, they read the patterns, and then they narrativize it. Uh, their business model, narrative science. I don't know if you guys know about this company, but they're, one of the things they've done really well uh, is demonstrate that. So, for example. One of the markets they've discovered is Little League Baseball. So little kids who play baseball. And no one covers that. So they, it's trivial for them. You just give them the data. It's an instant story. They know it's a, come from behind victory. So that's the vocabulary they, they lay on it. But they can write that story. It's trivially easy to write that story from the pitcher's position, from little Johnny the catcher's position, from you know Ted the, the second baseman. You can write that same story instantly from multiple perspectives and sell it to the par proud parents because it's the story of their kid. So it's a kind of an interesting development. It points to some of those instabilities that we've been talking about that we don't all see the same textual world. Um, it's being used in um, Ancestry.com is now using this like, OK, you join Ancestry. You collect all this crap. Now what? Well, the now what is like narrativize it. Because otherwise, people just have junk they don't know what to do with. So this will kind of spew out narratives. Can it write uh, screenplays? Well, they're, so their ambition is emphatically to do that, to write novels and screenplays and all that. So that's very much where they're where they're headed. And they're doing like a lot of blue box studies where right now you feed it data, like you feed it the data from a baseball game. What happens if you just drop the algorithms in a box of data and see what it connects, what dots it connects? Like I mean, it's not a it's not an uncool idea. Um, it's, again, it's all in the cultural frame. Um, so what, if, you, if you start to link up the, the kind of stuff these guys are doing, so this ability to kind of disaggregate a genre, break it into little bits, kind of a, a story assembly tool on the fly, um, and you combine it with like, like some of our image recognition technologies today, which are getting exponentially better. Last couple of years have been great for image recognition which was kind of, kind of muddling along for a long time. But last three or four years, it's really gotten quite good. Um, and you combine it with like taste predictors. What would happen if you could combine algorithmic storytelling with image recognition with taste prediction? Could you generate video stories? Could you generate image-based stories per individual? And the answer is not yet. <laughs> there are companies, Magisto would be one of them that's trying to do this, and it's, it's, it's kind of it's not great. Um, but it's not, it's not a misplaced idea. And I think as we watch like processing power ramp up and this kind of stuff take over, the kind of documentaries that we kind of can click through and navigate by hand at the moment, well, why wouldn't? You know, we know that that misses a lot of people who they want, they want to sit back. They don't want to lean forward. 
So couldn't we route you through a documentary in a way that was presumed to be meaningful for you? The answer is probably, the answer to that is probably yes. One example, again, a flawed but very interesting example is by uh, Guy Madden called uh, Seances, which is about the end of cinema. And basically, every time you visit this site, you see a unique, algorithmically constructed uh, film. You're the first and last person to see it. It's about the death of cinema. So once you see it, it's gone. <laughs> um, So here's Dennis's uh, project, um, Hospital with One Entrance. So one of the really, to me, really intriguing things in the world of like I image culture is, you know, we've had for a long time this debate. Uh, I don't know how this plays out in the real world, but this debate about the indexicality of the photo image, right? There's this long debate that photography is kind of special, let's say, compared to writing or or painting or whatever, because there's some kind of an imprint of the world on the celluloid. This is an argument that is fairly persistent in media studies. Uh, it comes from a, a 19th century American philosopher, Charles Sanders Peirce, who argues that signs in the world can take one of three forms. They can look like something, like a portrait looks like, it looks like my dog. It can symbolize something, it's just kind of arbitrary, so red, white, and blue. I would say the Netherlands, but you could say Russia, but you could say the US, you know, whatever, it's a symbol. And then there are signs like footprints on the sand, or like a wind, a wind vane blowing in the wind. Those kind of signs have a physical, causal relationship to the things they're representing. You can't see the wind, but you can see what the wind vane does because of the wind. You can't see the person that's now gone, having walked through the snow, but you can see their tracks. That's an index. And the argument embraced by people, often in the documentary world especially, but in the world of photography and film a lot, is that photography is indexical. It, someone had to be there. Abraham Lincoln had to be there for that image to be on the film. Now, that's a troublesome argument for lots of reasons. For example, if you just look at the, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, if you look at Kodak's color stock and the way in which black people were really kind of, it was difficult to represent them until 1986. 1986, when there's a change in stock, that's really good with chocolate and dark horses in the evening and black people. Um, they were like not really represented. And it wasn't about indexicality, it was about like the, the technology. Or if you look at the whole history of photography of ectoplasm, these, these forces that emanate from people when they have seances. There's a lot of photo documentation of that, or fairies, tons of photo documentation of that. Or the Chinese Communist Party, which kind of has these disappearing members all the time, like photo proof, they're not there. Like, it's a pretty dodgy argument to talk about indexicality in this sense. But these, these um, systems that are now primarily being used in, well, not primarily, they're being used as evidence for police crime scenes or insurance claims or archaeology, uh, things that are being shot now with, with LIDAR-based systems where basically you've got a data set, and this is what Dennis wrote about so, so well in his thesis, where you, you have basically a data set that if there's a claim to indexicality, in a way it's that data set, just measures. The little laser goes out and bounces back, and it yields a number. And billions of those are going into command. You have a big number list of distance. But to make that distance, to make those data points do anything, to make them dance, you need an algorithm. And the design of that algorithm it's as difficult to design you know, uh, that cup to like stay there and behave like a cup as it is to have that cup melt into a pool of water or to shatter or to, or to float. It is the same art. It's artifice. So this is a really interesting space now because of the combination of both kind of as close as you can get to making the case for, for, for indexicality, just measures, and absolute artifice mm -hmm. combined. And then, well, it's virtually real. Virtually real. Um, OK. So where this stuff is headed that I think is really like terrifying and interesting both um, is in terms of where it touches the body. And uh, I guess that's kind of a little overlay of the body. But especially in the VR domain, a lot of the attempts now, so, so the next gen VR stuff has, has pupil tracking in it. 
And it's just part of the bigger issue of like uh, uh, using biotrackers to to work with this kind of feedback mechanism, right? It's a, new, it's a data set, as, as we've already heard today. This is, the body is now in the picture, and, that, and the body can now be mined for responses that can help in the project of textual construction. So earlier we talked about like me and the world, the clarity of the modern, and now it's a little murkier because the algorithms are kind of reading my tastes and behaviors and using that to kind of cultivate and, 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 and construct a, a text. Well, now the loop is closing even tighter with this stuff in the sense it's happening on the fly, in real time, responsive textual systems. Systems that will respond to your gaze and your heartbeat and your, and your, and your sweat rate. Back to the sweaty palms. Um, so these trackers basically know what you're looking at, like what, even at what focal plane, and through your pupil they can read your heart rate. Um, and they know whether you're like getting excited by where you are. I talked to the uh, um, president of um, HTC China, and I was asking him like, what is most like, you know, standard like. Well, oh, so what was the best VR thing? And the guy like dropped his cup and said, I got to tell you this. Like this was incredible. Uh, he was at a trade show somewhere, saw a VR experience that blew his socks off. And when he found out how it was made, he was like really shocked. Basically, it was an incredibly compelling narrative. And um, it turned out that it was like effectively kind of a branching narrative, except that where he looked, if he would look at a particular character, or that was the steering mechanism for the narrative. So he got a narrative. And then it was do, do, reading um, biometrics from a band he was wearing. So he was given like a hell of a personal ride through this narrative environment, but it blew him away that it happened on the fly and that it happened seamlessly. And I mean, that's the space that these technologies are. are like choose your own ending without the choice. Huh? Like choose your own ending adventures without the choice. Without even thinking, yeah, no pre-thought, <laughs> simply based on like glance and, and uh, bio, bio markers. Do you know, do you know what that? Is that? No. It was, a it was a lab piece, so I don't know. I don't know where it came from. So I think it's, you know, we're, we're in this, the, the number one there, it's kind of small to read, but that's, the, that's kind of the 360 fixed. Number two is the kind of more, what we understand is, the, uh, you guys are going to see the enemy, so that would, number two would be much more like the, the enemy. There's no hand tracking there, but there's a lot of responsiveness from the characters you'll see. They'll, they'll follow, if you get really close to them, they'll back up. So there's a fair amount of response. But this third one is where the text is actually being constructed in dialogue with some reading of your, of your biomarkers. And again, that's just, a, just to say, this is another illustration of the kind of work algorithms are, are being tasked with that is potentially interesting and is potentially you know, terrifying, which is, again, my plea to kick this up to the... To the um, William Fove is a private company or, and... Yeah, Fove is a company that's one of the tracking, one of the eye tracker companies. There's a b bunch of them out there. So we're now at a stage where this, this technology is actually being implemented in a fairly widespread way. So those of you that, <laughs> it's not covered. Those of you that hide your, your cameras are, are doing well because, you know, marketers obviously are interested in the efficacy of, of their ads. And this is one of the ways that it's happening. And... It's a, it intrigues the hell out of me. The, this, this whole discourse is, is, a, is a really intriguing one. Um, um, realizes this company uh, that, that does these, what is it, six, the six parameters of emotion. But this goes back to the, this goes right back to the 19th century. Like, well, what is an emotion? Like, you know, let's forget the incredibly narrow cultural coding of what disgust looks like or what joy looks like. Uh, let alone physiognomy problems, like if you're black, it probably can't read you. But this goes right back directly to these kind of experiments in the, in the mid-19th century where uh, mental patients were jolted, their faces were electrocuted, and then the twitches that would respond were viewed as pure emotional states, categorized, um, cataloged. Charcot does a lot of this stuff. Del Sartre in the world of acting has these, has these very elaborate books culturally coded, like there's one for the Danish market, one for the French market, one for the Italian, uh, where you learn what this means. 
this. Or uh, you've seen it, if you've seen like early silent films or you haven't seen late 19th century theater, I know. But if you've seen whatever <laughs> translates over to film, you've seen people put their arms up to the table. You know, all, all that kind of body and sign language. Did I just drop the mic? Sorry. Um, all that kind of gestural language is understood as a kind of universal, well, universal, culturally specific in any case, kind of physiognomy and body language. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty much back to this stuff today, but in, but in uh, electronic, in, 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 in digital and algorithmically read form, and expanding it rapidly um, to gather lots more data metrics, skin temperature, galvanic response, movement, heart rate. There's an increasing amount of work, and Dennis did some wonderful stuff on this as well, uh, on this idea of the operational image. Um, Heike Sterl, who, I don't know, do you know her in Berlin? She's at the, the Kunsthochschule, I want to say, Academy der Kunst. She does wonderful stuff sort of looking at how images that don't just see and enable human actors, but images that act images that are capable of, of doing things on their own. And it's a, it's a, it's a concept that Faroki talked about in uh, 2003. And it's, it's picking up a lot of interest because we're at a moment where we can now actually circumvent the human interlocutor, as it will. The images can do the work. And you know we see this with, with uh, self-driving cars would be an example, right? where the car sees and acts without us having to intervene. We can override it. but. Basically, we're kind of a increasingly <laughs> unnecessary cog in the, in the system. Um, what's interesting with this is if you think of a of like a regular digital camera, that basically the the feed that the camera so what happens in the chip can basically be outputted either to the camera or directly to a like a, 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 a self vision system to a computer. When it goes to the camera, all kind of stuff happens to add, um, to add, to add color, to, to sort of take care of the grain. There's a lot of tweaking that the camera does. There's a lot of processing that occurs that makes that data into something we, our eye recognizes. But that same um, CCD chip can output directly to a computer as data that, that can drive a, uh, an algorithm, essentially. So it's kind of interesting now that the fakery part is actually happening for our eyes only. Um, this is so insidious. Right now, this is, this is Britain. In the Netherlands, these guys just, there's a car that just drives up and down the street in real time, issuing tickets in real time. It knows what's on the parking meter. It knows the license of the car. And it can drive you know, 30 miles an hour, issuing gazillions of tickets. Um, Huh? What does it look like? That's the car? Actually. No, the one in the Netherlands has like a big, uh, a big like thing on the top of the car, like a, like a little flying saucer on the top of the car. And it just like drives and, oh, you get it, oh, everything. So this is operational image. The image knows and already triggers the send of the, of the ticket. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my jurisdiction. That, that's in DC. It's just, um, they're at intersections and stuff. So, have you paid your insurance? Are you wanted? Do you, have you paid the toll for this bridge? Yeah. So this this is all example of kind of the operational. So algorithms that are actually like working, like not so much informing us or shaping our world. The cultural stuff that I mentioned at the outset. This is actually where they are doing things. They're tasked to circumvent the human and simply you know issue the ticket or put out the warrant or whatever. Um, but of course, there are lots of ways to beat the system. And increasingly interesting area, especially for arts engagement. And um, um, this, there's a lot of interesting studies, like how, like how can you try to defeat these systems? And they're getting pretty robust. The systems are hard to defeat, increasingly hard to defeat. But this, there's like some websites that, in this case, with that image, with that black image, does it kick up? Does it yield the right website? Like if you're trying to pirate the image. Will you be caught out? And this would be an example of like, yes. Um, but there are things like tin eye that can search for an image, but that, that can also help you to um, 
to tweak it a little bit. Like they do look pretty similar, but apparently, apparently the, the one on the right, the after, isn't, doesn't, doesn't pop up in an image search as, as the former. Um, so there's stuff happening on that level, like algorithms bat battling algorithms, like how can we defeat this system with just enough distortion that it doesn't code. Plenty of, plenty of ways to prank um, facial recognition systems. Um, these are very elite technologies. Well, this the is... The number of people that would be using these are in this system. Yeah, but this, this one is starting to grow. Like just, I'm starting to see more and more shirts out there that are camera-defeating shirts. I mean, I don't know if it's the Vogue or which community is actually doing it. Uh -huh. And maybe it's just a Berlin thing. <laughs> it looks like a Berlin thing, right? The masks, I don't know. I'm not sure Pixel Head is going to get you far, but try walking into a bank with that. <laughs> um, there's some makeup tips that, that uh, look really 70s. I don't know, but... <laughs> and this one's pretty, pretty cool, actually. It's a defeating technique. And then there's this way, which is, it strikes me, and this, is, this speaks to the kind of work you guys presented this morning. There are other ways of looking back. Of, of uh, you know, this, What can you do? You can try to stop technological development and stop capital investment, which is just you know, like a tough fight. You can and should, and I think the, pl the place I try to intervene is like changing the social frame, like saying, okay, you know, with universal health care, then actually some of these biomarkers are not a bad thing. But you can also hold the camera up to the, to the, to, to the perpetrators of these technologies. And those are conditions, you know, when you think of like, well, what are the rights around this stuff? Then yeah, transparency and equity become really important issues. Data equity makes data a lot more interesting if we all have access to the same sets. If I can look at you as much as you can look at me, then like fine, we're talking about an extension of the public domain. And that's where things like this are really interesting interventions. Do you guys know this project? Do, do you all know it? Um, where people are basically sending in stories uh, about police, uh, people who die in the hands of police in the US, data sets that the FBI says they can't construct and don't know about, but the Guardian is doing a perfectly good job of, uh, of gathering that stuff, checking out the stories, and letting you kind of massage and manipulate the, you know, look at the evidence in different ways and see what stories it tells. So this, this, this rebalancing of the power strikes me as another really crucial way to go. Because it is going to be hard to put the genie back in the box. Um, so then what are, the, what are the sites of tactical intervention? But, but that's what we're here to spend the next uh, couple of days talking about. Um, yeah. That's it, wow. so even... Right